Ziva's new book is a great read. It draws you in quickly and holds your interest until the end. And you'll have a chance after her talk and some questions and our reception to purchase a copy and have her sign it for you. It's based on her teaching of Bible to seventh graders in a Jewish day school. And it's a strong example of teacher research, which has become a very lively and growing arena of scholarship in general education, but much less so in Jewish education. And Ziva is really one of the, the pioneers um, developing this kind of serious scholarship. You would be mistaken, however, if you expected such research to be highly subjective and local. Ziva does bring us right into her classroom where we hear the voices of her students and we learn about her own decisions as their teacher. But she offers readers, she also offers readers an original theory about how interpretive rules operate in text-based classroom discussions. By going deeply into the particulars of students' interpretive activity, Ziva arrives at a powerful lesson about how to help students share and teach their own ideas about the meaning of a biblical text. Ziva's scholarship bridges the worlds of Jewish and general education. It speaks to literacy researchers and practitioners. It advances our understanding of how to help students learn to read texts and learn to read the world. Please join me in welcoming Ziva Hassenfeld to the podium. Ziva will speak for about 20 minutes. We'll open the floor for questions and answers, and then you'll have a chance to buy a book and have it signed by Ziva. All yours. Thank you so much for being here uh, and celebrating the publication of my book, The Second Conversation, Interpretive Authority in the Bible Classroom. Um, it's interesting to be at your own book party because, oh, and thank you to everyone online too. Um, they're there, right? Because that's where my parents are, so they have to be there. Um, yeah, there's something, it's like your own book party is, so when I got this job, and I read about this in my acknowledgments, Jonathan Sarna, Professor Jonathan Sarna, invited me to his house before I even started. And I, I wasn't sure exactly what we were going to talk about. Um, but I sat down in his living room, and the first thing he said is, have you started writing your book? Takes a while. Um, which I thought was sound advice for someone who was beginning um, a few months later. So I started to write this book, and it did take a while. But I want to share with you today, there are a lot of books in the world. Um, but this one feels like it has something to contribute. And I want to talk about it from three different perspectives. First, I want to talk about it from the context of Jewish education. Then I want to talk about it from the context of literacy research. And finally, I want to talk about what it means as an academic scholar and professor to uh, conduct teacher research. So what happens in this book is this is a teacher journey book. This is a book about my own journey, um, not in like a eat, pray, love sort of way, but uh, in a, wow, I learned a lot of theory. How do I apply it? And I, I will talk about this more in the third section of this talk, but when I finished my doctorate, um, I felt really proud. I had two kids. I wasn't sure I was gonna finish it. And I called up Susie Tanchel, who's sitting in the front row. Well, no one sits in the front row, the second row. And I said, Susie, I have a doctorate. Aren't you proud? And she's like, ah, everyone has a doctorate. Can you still teach? I said, can I still teach Challenge Accepted? And so what this book uh, does is it, first, Susie said, come teach. And I was like, oh, wow, she'll have me teach seventh grade Tanakh. Little did I know that middle school Jewish studies is not actually such a hard position to get. Uh, but I felt very honored at the time that she was going to let me do my teacher research there. I'm revealing where I did the research just for the people in this room and on Zoom. Um, and I, my goal was to create the most intentional, educational, uplifting, empowering, uh, purposeful text classroom that ever existed, ever. 
So um, that's what this book is about. And it turned out that there were some, some bumps along the way. Um, and I'm gonna describe them by doing three things. Let's start in Jewish education. Actually, you know what? Let's back up and let's start with, I just like, I'm looking at this room and I just wanna say a few thank yous before I get into my theoretical framework. Um, I'm also like sort of looking at Zoom, but I can't see who's there. I won't do the full thank you of like a bar and bat mitzvah speech, but I do wanna thank at the very least um, my research center, the Mandel Center for Studies in Jewish Education, who made this book come to fruition. Uh, my home in education studies, Leah Gordon and Danielle, uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for supporting this from the beginning. Thank you for giving me a platform uh, in this job. And uh, to Sylvia from Brandeis Press, who you're my rock in this. So thank you for being here and thank you for making this book happen and telling me that um, it was good in moments where I wasn't sure. So, okay, there are more thank yous, but I won't get into all of them. Those are just the ones that I wanna make sure not to miss. Research in Jewish education is a field that is actually quite nascent in the context of academic fields. Uh, it was really an act of faith that it was even created. And um, a lot of work happened around how to teach the Bible. Susie, being, I'll stop citing you all the time. I'm just excited that you're here. Um, Susie being one of the leading scholars. And Barry Holtz, created uh, the idea of orientations. And he said that essentially in the modern American Jewish landscape, we have a lot of, a menu of options of how we can read the biblical text. Um, and this paralleled work that was happening in literacy, but, uh, and was happening around teaching English and literature. But he said, you can, you can teach the text uh, from a critical historical perspective. You can teach the text from a new critical perspective and engage in sort of formula formulistic close reading. You can teach the text from a reader response and really focus on what is, what is the impact that the text has on me? How does it speak to me? And there are a number of other ways that you can read the text. And this was really profound, both in the area of research of Jewish education and also in the teaching. Um, I think that it led to the work that happened around uh, standards and benchmarks. I think that all of the work, which was the professional development around Jewish education, the teaching of Tanakh really took this idea, wow, there are multiple disciplines that we could apply to the Bible and different teachers in different schools and in different classrooms apply different ways of reading. So when I began teaching at Gann Academy, uh, and I don't know when, uh, 2008, uh, this, was, this was on sort of, this was what we were, this was the sand that we were playing in. This was the water that we were swimming in. And we, in some ways, would teach different orientations to the biblical text, different years. And when you got to the senior year, you got to learn the historical contextual approach. So you can imagine, and uh, should, should I cite you again? Okay. Uh, you can imagine if you've been in Jewish day school for 12 years, um, what the experience might be like to finally get to your senior year and start to learn the documentary hypothesis. And I imagined it and I decided, I thought that I had a clear way to teach it. And I really, this is, you know, I'm 24, uh, I have a lot of time on my hand. Um, and my husband Jonah and I work on this piece. Do you all know who Eminem is? Do you remember? I think he's like 60 now, but he was cool back then. And um, so I, we thought that this is a really big unit, right? And the best thing we could do was sort of think about what does it mean to read any text from a source critical perspective? And so I assigned my students something and I'm gonna spend a few minutes reading it to you. 
This is back in 2008. It has long been considered the opinion of the great majority of people that the Eminemic Canon, including the Slim Shady LP, the Marshall Mathers LP, and the Eminem Show constitutes a literary unity. I wanted to welcome you all by playing Eminem, but we couldn't find a song that was acceptable. Although, men, so this will, I will be actually uh, not reading the full version of what I gave to my 12th graders. Although many communities are deeply committed to the belief that the above named collections of poetry are the work of a single author named Eminem, who composed them during the late 1990s, the scholarly work of the last several decades has begun to compile a considerable body of evidence and argumentation that makes the hypothesis of a single authorship increasingly unlikely. Anybody know where this is going? Key arguments in the multi-document hypothesis. The first argument rests on the obvious differences in the names by which the protagonist is called. Sometimes the protagonist is called Slim Shady, sometimes Eminem, and sometimes Marshall Mathers. We will refer to the three sources as S, E, and M. Secondly, one must contend with the clear differences in style and word choice in the three sources. S tends to include a second voice with his poem that repeats the words of the primary speaker. E has a more aloof style, insofar as he seems to be aware of the other two sources. Next, differences in style and language. All three sources use very different styles. Third, thematic elements. And here I'll read. Although many proponents of the single author hypothesis explain the differences in name as depicting three different aspects of one author, the differences in thematic material across the three sources begin to make this hypothesis increasingly tenuous. S displays all the symptoms of psychosis, while M always says he's just kidding. And it goes on and on to conclude the use of different names by the protagonists throughout the canon, the linguistic and stylistic differences, the thematic differences, and the conflicting parallel narratives to be detailed in a future publication within the Eminemic canon all provide support for the multi-author hypothesis, to which I gave this to my 12th grade students. I said, what do you guys think? They said, well, clearly, this is three different sources, to which I said to them, but Eminem is alive. And, and, and this sort of was how I delightfully started our unit on the uh, historical critical approach to the Bible. When I went to uh, discuss this with my department, they were less than happy with me, which began my journey to doing this book. Uh, and what basically the conversation that ensued was, why are you, what are you doing? Like, just like, first and foremost, what are you doing? Why are you teaching them an app? Secondly, they don't know, they haven't read any of the theories about the authors. So how, they don't have the background knowledge they need to understand why we're gonna divide the sources the way that we're gonna divide them. And as a 24 year old, I said back to them like, but, but I'm trying to give them the tools to understand how you read in this particular method. And this to me was the biggest question that happened in my teaching round one, because there was a clear debate and the work by Barry Holtz and the work on orientations and all the work that had happened thus far in research in Jewish education and particularly in Bible had was absolutely silent on this. What are we going to do here? Are we going to transmit meanings of texts according to different approaches? Or are we going to teach kids the rules of the game? How you read texts according to these different approaches. And to me, the fact that we had not answered this question felt dire. I mean, relatively speaking, in an academic way. 
Okay. Part one. You with me or did I lose you on Eminem? You kind of want to listen to him again, right? Or, or you don't, time. Okay, I'm moving, I'm moving. That's part one. I want to talk about, I want to talk about literacy right now, okay? And then I'm going to pull it all together. Okay, so, so that's Jewish education, chapter one. Off I go uh, to, do my, to do my doctoral training where no one in the School of Education really had much to say about the Bible at all and uh, felt a little embarrassed that I was talking about it all the time. And um, what they did have to say a lot about is pedagogy and literacy. And this is what was happening. So essentially, I left Jewish education, that chapter, with this question of, are we going to teach the rules of engagement, the rules of reading, or are we going to just transmit interpretations according to each sort of method? Um, the answer in general education broadly was, clearly, you teach the rules. Clearly, and this was, this was broadly in the category of cognitive apprenticeship and uh, the work around that, that Lee Shulman was doing. And uh, for the sake of time, I won't do all the name dropping that I'm tempted to do. But this work around um, what we want to do is we want to teach students to read like experts. We want to teach students to do math like experts. We want to teach students to, to do history like experts. And so in the whole movement of cognitive apprenticeship, which was sort of happening squarely in the world of education, the answer was clear. We're going to teach students ways of thinking. We're going to teach students ways of reading. Um, and that was really interesting. But then there was one other thing happening in literacy, which extended far beyond just education, that um, caught my interest and really motivated this book. So I want to tell that story on one foot, not literally, but just as far as timing. OK. So here, and um, here's how I want to tell that story. So broadly, my, my question had been answered, but it gets complicated, and it gets complicated in a body of research that basically asked this question, expert according to who? And this question, which broadly is sociocultural literacy, sociocultural cognition, in my mind, disrupted everything because it started to go to the balcony and say, let's look at literacy, let's look at education in a broader context of society, in a broader context of history, and in a broader context of power and equity. And what is literacy? Is it always necessarily a force of good? Or, and this is the work of Brian Street, this is the work of Shirley Bryce Heath, or is there a problematic component of the history of literacy that looks at, that sort of uses literacy as a tool of subjugation, as a tool of hierarchy, of a tool of reaffirming power structures that exist? And the answer was, it does, right? This, this again, interestingly, starts back in religious education and how is literacy used to spread Christianity, to spread uh, Protestant doctrine, and ends in schools. And the way that it starts in religion and ends in schools is a story of basically saying, we can tell you what makes an individual superior to any other individual. In fact, we can tell you what makes a society superior to any other society. And the answer is a very narrow definition of literacy. And we are going to attach so much cognitive and moral weight to that particular definition that it almost, the deck is rigged. Is that the expression? The deck is stacked. I am just, expressions are not my thing. Okay, the, the deck is stacked. And this sort of broke literacy, this broke the entire field of literacy because all of a sudden, we can't simply train students to read like experts because we have a question of experts according to who. And this, this gets into 
breaking the notion of autonomous literacy thesis, and, and it brings about multi-literacies and multiple literacies and new literacies. And all of a sudden, let's expand the notion of literacy. Let's expand it broadly. Let's look at how texts are used in different communities. Let's stop imagining that there's an expert that happens to look exactly like the people who already have power. So this was pretty, this was, uh, this was disruptive and this was profound. And once you sort of say, you know what, your literacy is, your way of using text is really powerful and my way of using text is really powerful. And the fact that uh, we're only giving value to one is extremely problematic. Then we start talking about home literacies and we start talking about religious literacies again in the context of other powerful ways of relating to text so that uh, Brian Street looks at the way that we recite Quranic, that certain communities will recite the Quran and that it's not necessarily about uh, offering a really um, coherent and clear interpretation that, that, that reflects anything in the text, but it's actually about the experience of recitation. And that too has value. And one more thing is added to this pot that takes schools to a really uh, hard place, a hard place that I think my book gets us out of, okay? But a hard place not fully gets us out of, but starts to think about it, okay? And the next thing is, and by the way, how do people learn? Well, they sit in chairs and I lecture and you receive, right? And best if we do that away from everyone else, like in a room in like some building where you're quarantined away from all the adults in your life, right? And now I'm talking about situated learning, which also comes into the mix, which disrupts this sort of fantasy of school learning by saying all learning is situated. The best way to learn is by legitimate peripheral participation, by actually seeing people that you care about, people that you're invested with, doing whatever it is that you want to do. So uh, the classic examples from Laven Wenger uh, look at communities like midwives. You can read as many books as you want on delivering babies. So I hear, I've actually never delivered a baby, but you can read as many books as you want. You don't know how to do it unless you've actually been there. Anyone here delivered a baby? Can confirm? Laven Wenger say so, so it's true. Okay, you, another example they use, right? That you, Alcoholics Anonymous, that actually you need to be in the community of practice to learn how to be a part of that community, how to use their practices for stopping addiction, et cetera, et cetera. And so now we have two big problems on our plate. One, who's to say what good reading is? What are we even doing, right? Because if you if you stack the deck such that only certain literacy practices are considered good, and you combine that with the idea that actually school is probably the least ideal context for learning, if we're, if we're actually thinking about learning, then you have a real problem once you get into the classroom, which is one, I really have no power to say what way we should read texts. And two, even if I think I have power, I'm ineffective anyways. And then I graduated graduate school and decided to go teach. That's where this book joins uh, the story. So I call Susie up and I say, knowing all these things, I want to try to teach again. Um, ignorance is bliss. I was probably a better teacher before I had all that theory. But I went into the classroom and I, I had a, you know, all the fancy academic stuff. I had a grant and I had a research assistant and I had methods for collecting data and I was really disciplined about keeping teacher journals and recording the classes and my research assistant was there and we did all that but essentially I was I was a seventh grade teacher and my goal was given all of those constraints how could I make the bible classroom a meaningful literate 
literary experience for the students who are sitting there. And that's really the journey of this book. Should I tell you the answer or let you read it? All right, I'll tell you. Uh, okay. So the first thing I tried was nothing at all, okay? Because who was I anyways to tell them how to read the text? We're working in a model of multiliteracies where the best thing you can do is allow students to bring their funds of knowledge into the classroom, allow students to bring their home literacies into the classroom, allow them to bring the ways that they make meaning of the world into your classroom. So I tried that. <laughs> You're laughing because when I'm in a room of teachers, they just start laughing so hard at this point because for whatever reason, we know that actually, maybe it's the grammar of schooling, maybe it's just the nature of humans, but that if I abdicate authority, interpretive authority, does everyone say, okay, so how should we distribute authority? No, the popular kid takes it, right? So all of a sudden I had abdicated interpretive authority as a teacher and the student in my class just starts deciding what the text means and everyone's like, oh yeah, that makes sense. I'm like, what? So if she's gonna take authority, I should. And so I needed something better. And so the first two chapters are talking about like all the reasons why I thought we needed to distribute interpretive authority and that what that meant was for me to do nothing at all. What I discover in this book, what I discover in this book is that there's actually a place, even with everything I'm talking about, situated learning, the best, most authentic, most effective learning will never happen in the context of a classroom. I know that if you're not in education, that sounds crazy because you're like, well, I send my kids every day, but we can deal with that. Okay. Cause it's true. Okay. Even with that realization that effective education and the most profound education will never happen in the context of a classroom and the realization that we must as just ethical, multicultural people stop imagining who the expert reader is and make room for all the different ways that people relate to texts, use texts, even create, take expansive views on what counts as a text. Even with those two realizations, there is a place for the teacher in a classroom. And this is what I'm gonna say the place is. All of that that I'm holding, I don't need to hold for myself. I can actually give that gift to my students. I can actually teach them a thing or two about how textual meaning works in the world. And that's what I set to do in this book. Once I realized that there was a role for me in the classroom, I decided what that role was going to be was to induct my students very explicitly into a particular literacy practice. Not to say that this literacy practice is better than any other, not to say this is a literacy practice I expect and assume that you are doing at home, and if not, be quiet and don't mention it, but just to say, this is the literacy practice I want us to do in our classroom. Will you try it? Will you hold my hand and come along and try it? And that, and then allowing them to reflect on it, was the biggest gift that I could ever give any student because language and text is really all we have. And so any way that we can help students, humans, ourselves, understand how it works is a way of peace, is a way of learning, is a way of self-understanding, is a gift of expression and communication. And so that's really what this book is about. It's about allowing my students through inviting them into a literacy practice and reflecting on it to understand the way that text, interpretation, language, and meaning works in the world. I wanna end with just one last point. I think I was supposed to talk for less time, but it's my show, it's my party. Um, I wanna say one last thing. I don't think 
it's a small deal that this is teacher research. And we can, we can sort of wax poetics about this, but it's actually infuriating how we treat teachers in this world. It is actually still unimaginable the level of respect or lack of respect that we give teachers. And there's something that can happen when you move out of the daily grind. And I say grind because you can't even easily make a cup of coffee in a school, okay? That is like my now new thing of how I represent that schools are a hard place to be in. I think there's more to it, but I'm gonna use coffee as my metaphor, okay? You can't even easily make a cup of coffee. And the fact that we have an entire discipline, academic discipline, built around studying, teaching and learning, and that we could do that entire academic discipline without ourselves. And I don't mean teaching like you nice college students who sit there beautifully and then feed yourselves and don't need us for recess. I mean like the grind of the school day. The fact that we could create an entire discipline around this without actually living it, to me feels problematic. And so I wanna really um, elevate the fact that this is teacher research. I wanna elevate the fact that Brandeis University, that Mandel Center, that education studies encouraged and allowed me to do teacher research in this way, in this real way. I was at parent-teacher conferences. I was the, I was the teacher, right, Marina? He, right, your, your son didn't think of me as anything but the teacher, he did, but his classmates did it, okay? The fact that that is the root of this research, research feels uh, profoundly subversive in a positive way, and I don't wanna lose that. Thank you guys so much for joining me today and letting me talk about this book. I mean, one of the things that I feel proudest of is that the, we started inducting pre-service teachers into action research in the MAT program. This is a big part of our, our practice. And the center also has been trying to really promote this kind of serious practitioner-based research on teaching and learning in Jewish education since its founding. But this is a chance for you to ask Ziva questions. There's a microphone here in the middle aisle and I'll invite people to come up and um, pose questions to Ziva. And then I'll also look at the chat and see what kind of questions our, our audience online has for you as well. So who wants to pose the first question? You don't have to have bread. <laughs> Please. Okay, it's working now. Hi, Ziva. Thank you. This was really amazing and beautiful and very stimulating intellectually. Um, I'm wondering if you have any advice for future teachers of text? Yeah, that's a great <laughs> question. Um, yeah, I have so much advice that uh, the question is, okay, if I'm just answering a question in the Q and A, how would I how would I put it? Um, but I, I mean, I I think I think like uh, curiosity about your students and conviction that um, that you have a role to play. I think if you can keep those two side by side, curiosity and a sense of purpose, and and really allow those two to be in tension with each other, that's the first step. I have actually two different kinds of questions. So one question is, um, I'd like to understand better the difference between an orientation and rules of interpretation. You're, you made that distinction. Um, and I'll ask my second question. You can decide which one you want to answer in what order. I think it's, um, I'm, I'm very interested in the challenge of learning the teacher's role in a progressive classroom, right? The idea that teachers have a role in student-centered education is a complicated 
idea to, to find what, what is your role? And I wonder if you have some thoughts about, I mean, John Dewey, many, many decades ago, um, tried to promote a view of, of teaching and learning in which uh, students had many opportunities to make choices about what to learn and how to learn, but teachers also created the environment of that learning. So, and by and large, he failed to promote that idea. People, teachers didn't get it. And we ended up either, you know, the famous cartoon in the New Yorker, do we have to teach or do we have to do today what we want to do today, is a way of, car of caricaturing the idea that student-centered learning needs, let the students do whatever they want to do, and you step back and now you're promoting autonomy. So I wonder, and maybe this would be even the more interesting question to focus on, what makes it so hard for a teacher who's committed to making space for students and their ideas and interests to understand that there is a really critical role in laying the groundwork for that to be productive? Because that's a big piece of what I learned from your book. It's not that you, know, you did a lot of things that made it possible for students to be autonomous. And yeah. why is that so hard? To, to learn as great. I'm gonna start with the second question and yeah. I, I could get to the first. Um, the first question is a little bit um, academic in particular to our field, which to me is fascinating, but I worry I'll get going and then I'll lose. Uh, the second question about progressive education and the teacher's role is relevant to everyone who's ever been in school or sent someone to school. So I feel that that, um, Here's what I want to say about that. So one of the things, and, and this is why it's really significant that I am rooted in Jewish education um, and I am rooted in Jewish scriptural literacy practices because anyone who studied Jewish texts understands just how elastic the rules can be. In other words, within Jewish literacy practices, sometimes it's okay to actually change the word. Sometimes it's okay to say, because this word happens to appear all the way over there, I'll just import the meaning here, even though there's no reason to. But what is reason to? Um, because, um, because I don't like what it seems to be saying, I'll change it. Um, and so, so I, having, having sort of spent a lot of time in this literacy practice, one of the things that was really striking to me in, in academic work around teaching, particularly around teaching texts, was sort of the lack of clarity and definition around off the wall interpretation or wrong interpretation. And this idea was thrown out all the time uh, and still is thrown out all the time. Um, and two things really struck me. One, there are a lot of there are a lot of implicit rules about what you're not allowed to say. So let me give you an example. And and you don't have to be sympathetic to the kid. It's just an example. Okay, I could give you ones where you would be sympathetic. But uh, I was I was sitting in a in a private prep school in the Bay Area. So you can imagine who was in that classroom. And they were reading a book where, and I should know the name of the book, but I'm doing this off the cuff, uh, where there's a fire and the furniture burns. And, and the mother and the child have to save up to buy new furniture. And a kid in the classroom raises their hand, you know, they had just gone back from skiing in Tahoe, whatever, and was like, but that would be so fun. You could just go to the store and buy all new furniture. We did that last week. And the teacher was like, No. And, 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 and there were so many ways that a teacher could sort of raise the issue of, 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 of class and, and social awareness, but it became this implicit interpretive rule. When we're in public, we don't offer interpretations that showcase our wealth. How the heck would the kid know that? And so that's a side of like, even the most progressive education educators have tons of implicit interpretive rules and boundaries. And then sort of on the flip side, you, I, would, I would go into, I would talk about a Bible classroom, an Orthodox Bible classroom, and I would say, uh, and 
right? We, and, and the teacher would assume the text was inerrant. And my colleagues would be like, that's a funny wrong assumption. Wrong according to who? And so the, I think what we get caught up with in progressive education is imagining that we don't have interpretive boundaries and rules when we do. And so, so to me, the question for every progressive educator is what interpretations don't you allow in your classroom and why? It's not that you can't have boundaries, but, oh, that got you going? <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, but you need to ask yourself what they are and then clarify them to the students, right? So that they can be on the same page as you. Yes. Um, so the title of the book, The Second Conversation, signals um, one of the arguments, which is about the importance of what you call a second conversation. That's, that's uh, I don't know, do we get a nickel every time we say the word second conversation, right? Um, uh, that you wanna make space for the second conversation, you wanna honor the second conversation, you wanna invite teachers to actually make this um, an explicit part of their practice. So can you say a little bit more why? Yeah. Um, and to sharpen it, there are literacy practices all over. You've talked about that. You know, the vast majority of those literacy practices don't involve a second conversation. They are simply taught through induction. Young people or novices in any particular domain learn how to do the thing. We don't need to actually talk about the thing. We just learn how to do the thing. But you're saying there's something else here in this particular environment that demands, that's putting it strongly, but maybe demands space for the second conversation. So tell us why. Absolutely. And at some point you all will, and you constantly do have the second conversation. And the only question is, can you do it well or not? I'm not saying like, read my book and you'll do it well. Okay. But at least you'll have some language for it. Um, so it's not like, oh, you could just be inducted into a literacy press. You'll never get into a second conversation. Uh, the second conversation is when literacy practices come to a head and come into conflict with each other. Okay, so that's sort of like the first conversation is when we understand the rules of the game. Okay, uh, slow children at play. We understand that if I put this up here, I'm like already doing this sort of academic thing and maybe you'll know that I want you to do fun things with that, right? Like point out that slow could be an adjective or a command. Uh, the second conversation would uh, come if you were driving and started on a street sign and I'm speeding down the road and you're like, uh, slow, children not play. And I was like, no, it means like, it could mean like the slow family went to see uh, Cinderella. And you would say, uh, I don't think it means that here. Could you please apply my interpretive rules, not yours? And that's sort of the second conversation. Okay, now you're thinking, I don't have those, but you do have them, okay? Because it's also about tone. It's also about, um, about it comes up a lot about authorial intent. I don't need to read this text because that author is awful, right? And there's anyways too much text in the world. So I can't possibly read all the text. And so what text we even, grace with reading is already the second conversation. And so what I'm suggesting in this book is that the classroom is actually, right, now that I've deconstructed all the reasons why the classroom is not ideal for learning, it's actually an ideal place for this metacognitive skill of understanding that we can talk about this. And the teacher's role is to help students talk it through. So I'm gonna pose a question from the our online audience. So quite a number of people, um, asked a question related to teacher research that went something like, um, you don't have a grant and a research assistant, but how, what advice do you have for teachers who might want to start studying yeah. their own Great. teaching practice or their students' learning? Great, thank you so much for that question. Uh, and, I, and, and first I just wanna admit like, I really like uh, got a little hyperbolic and, 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 and self-congratulatory about doing teacher research, but obviously, uh, I was teaching one class, and so I wasn't running from class to class, and then recess, and then bath. Is there bathroom duty? I don't even know. Because before, when I taught full time, it was high school. Um, so, 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 a. I want to amplify the question by saying, even I, 
even with all my research assistance, wasn't even fully in it. And that said, I still obviously, like you said, as I learned in the MAT here, believe that teacher research is possible. And I would say the start is just journaling. In the same way uh, that you can journal about your life and you'll come back and look at it in a year and be like, oh, I forgot that. Same thing happens with teaching. And if you can take five minutes a day to just write, what were the questions? What were the dilemmas of practice that came up today? That is going to go so far in teacher research. So that's where I would start. What? Yes, yes, yes. And Susie says student work. Hi, a uh, long time listener, first time caller. Um, I have a question as a non-academic, but as a parent of students in a Jewish day school environment. Um, and you know, what struck me, you said, okay, a lot of learning happens sort of outside the classroom. Yeah. And I heard you also mention about a parent teacher conference. And so I wonder if in your studies and in your research, you encountered anything about how parents and how families would fit into this role, how to support their children's learning, um, whether that's working with teachers or how else they would support the children or as a family. Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, I wanted someone to ask that. So there are a lot of parents who have invested a lot in schools. So for me to sort of stand up here and be like, schools are really like not where it's at. Uh, so thank you for asking that. It's someone along with me who's very invested in schools. Um, I think the best insight of situated learning is that there's nothing that you can sort of, um, you can you can sort of send away. In other words, anything that you care about, you have to show that you care about it. Because otherwise, to use academic terms, it becomes encapsulated. That really, if you take, it could be daunting, but if you take the premise that the home is the most powerful source of education, then, then that sort of raises the bar on what you do. So if you care about math, do some math at home. If you care about computer programming, do some computer programming at home. If you care about literacy, right? Like there are stories of people who say like, I hope this is okay to tell the story, but like my kid doesn't know Shabbat Musaf. What are you doing wrong at school? And the Jewish days will say, well, we don't actually meet on Shabbat. So how could I teach your kids Shabbat Musaf, right? Like that's on you, like you have to, right? And so to sort of, and we live in a culture where you, where you sort of, you hire the expert to do things. And so it's a very countercultural idea, the idea of situated learning, that actually like it is the home and everything else supports the home. So I think it's just sort of about like really taking that idea seriously and saying, okay, what would that mean? Uh, and for me, you know, the struggle is sometimes like, I just don't wanna read like Dear Mr. Blueberry again, you know? Like I have work to do, just go to sleep. And then I'm like, no, like <laughs> you can't preach it by day and not live it by night. Like if you care about literacy, you better read your kids a book before bed. And so that's like just a personal moment where I have that sort of refrain, like it starts at home. It doesn't end at home, but it starts at home. So you offered us a really compelling intellectual biography or autobiography up until I think maybe halfway through your first year of teaching or something like that, the second time around um, after you were poisoned by graduate school. Um, so where are you now? Like finish the story, like where, like what is the last chapter of that intellectual biography? Jonathan, that's hard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I'll answer like 90% honestly, okay? Um, I, I want to say that teacher research was much easier to do in the context of a postdoc and the context of a grant that allows you to actually do it. And so one of the challenges is like, if that's the form of research I believe in, and I've done it since. I did it during COVID, but it's been hard to do it since. It's like, I'm, I'm actually in a different milieu. I'm at Brandeis. Um, and so it's something that I think about a lot about like, okay, if this is the form of research that I believe is the best form of research, how do I get back to it? And how do I do that? How do I allow myself to do that? And so it's actually, to be honest with you, it's a challenge because you cannot call a school and say, I've tried, I actually tried. 
I was like, I don't know, once I get my teaching schedule, then we could work around it. And they're like, okay, D block is nine o'clock on Mondays, four o'clock on Wednesdays, and 11.30 to 11.45 on Tuesdays. And I'm like, so, so there is, a, obviously there's a tension and it's not a simple thing. And so, uh, but when I can't do it, I try to support teachers in the classroom doing it themselves. Thank you. Um, and it's, it's been very exciting to see this book evolve over time. So I have two questions. Um, the first is, so is the, I'm thinking about Sharon's question about the role of the teacher in the progressive classroom. And is your answer that we need the role of the teacher to induct students into a particular way of interpreting or that the teacher says, here's the menu of options for interpretation ultimately you go and choose, or am I answering the wrong question? So that was one. And then the second question is, I'm really curious how this affects your classroom teaching, teaching at Brandeis, right? How what you know about the complexity of interpretation affects what you do when you step into the classroom here. Okay, so that first question was actually like um, very much the main question I got from fellow academics in literacy, uh, which was like, why you? Like do a democratic process with all the seventh graders and you could decide together the interpretive rules. And I think it's a really good question because I actually think that is the ideal. The reality of the classroom for me, and maybe I just wasn't there in my own teaching, was, uh, was, that, was that, you know, it's not like when you sort of, coerce the kids to like a contract of classroom rules where there already no sort of the expectations for them that I didn't feel like I could make it a democratic process in an, in an authentic and genuine way without being sort of a little bit uh, pressuring them in one direction or another. And one thing that I was not willing to get to let go of, which I think they might have, was that we were going to cite textual evidence. And so when I saw that they actually this group of students actually didn't feel that that was important. And I, and I write about this in the book. I was like, oh, no, 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 <laughs> we're doing that. So I think this is a really honest answer. I think ideally it should be democratic, but teachers have to do the work on themselves of what are they willing to be flexible about and what are they not? And to come into a classroom knowing that, because if you pretend that you're flexible and you're not, that's kind of the worst case scenario. And there are times where you're allowed to say, try something, hold my hand and come with me. I know you don't see the value in it right now. And the biggest one was like, I don't want to just say things in the biblical text. We're a typo. Not because I don't think that necessarily they were a mistake or they're right. Like, I just don't think that's a fun way of reading. And I want you to try not reading that way. And so that's ultimately, but it's a really important question. It was a question I got a lot. Like, why can't you do this democratically? Um, but I always sort of give the example of like, what if the kid was like, what if like the majority of the class was like, okay, let's express all interpretations through dance. And, and we voted, and they, right? Like there, are, so I didn't want to pretend, um, but yeah. And what was your second question? Brandeis, okay. Um, I don't know, like, this is this is a really important question, and 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 I think I think the the sort of easy answer is that I'm always teaching ways of reading, and when I teach a course on reading research, it's about how do you read research, and how do you read out of order, and how do you read methods before you read lit review, even though lit review comes first. But the truth of the matter is that the ecosystem of a college classroom is just a whole other animal than elementary or K through 12, and so I do try to sort of it does. But I don't like, like classroom management is just not a thing in universities. You know, if they don't want to be there, they don't come. And so um, I do sort of want to, again, elevate and amplify the work of K through 12 teachers by saying like, oh, it's, it's, it's really hard and it's something completely different than what we do here. So we're gonna call, we're gonna call into the questions so that you'll have time both to share some refreshments, to buy a book, to have Ziva sign your book. Um, we'll share the questions from our online audience with Ziva who might be motivated to respond to some of them. There weren't so many and they open up some interesting issues. 
And so I want to thank Ziva for producing such an important book that advances our understanding of teaching and its complexities and challenges, some of which you illuminated in your talk today. And let's have a round of applause for this wonderful accomplishment. So time to share some refreshments.